Okay. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Carmen for suggesting me at this meeting and Martin for doing such a fantastic job of organising it. I've really enjoyed what I've learnt here and the people that I've met. It's been just great. So um, I'm going to start by showing you, getting out of this actually, and showing you a little movie that some of you might recognise. I'm just interested in how many of you will recognise this. I know there's no feeding, but it doesn't really We brought these children together because we wanted a glimpse of England in the year 2000. The shop steward and the executive of the year 2000 are now seven years old. Give me a child until he is seven and I will give you the man. So, um, I guess no, nobody looked like they recognised Let's get to know it. these children. So, it, so basically, this was an ex, a television experiment about 50 years ago um, where the idea was that um, by, by watching children, just about 20 children, over a long period of time, you could learn what was, as the Jesuit saying, you give me a child when I'm seven, uh, I'll give you the man, you know, what, what's actually encoded at the beginning and what's imposed later. And uh, it was just the idea that longitudinal, highly individualistic uh, investigations could be informative compared to the more standard approaches. And of course, there's been many cohort studies in public health and so on that have illustrated the power of that in a much more scientific, this was purely entertainment. Um, but um, I show it just because it kind of illustrates here how what we do is really quite different from a lot of the more snapshot type uh, experiments that are yielding this vast array of data that um, we're all looking at now, whether it's omics and things like that, where, uh, you know, we've got a lot, a, a lot of population-based analysis, a lot of single-cell analysis, but we have less of the sort of longitudinal analysis, which means we've always got these black boxes, and we've talked a lot this week about how you try and fill these black boxes of missing information to infer what might be happening. And of course, there's always the risk that you're going to be missing out on some information and, and misconstruing. So uh, that's sort of the premise for what I'm talking about here. Um, so that was the movie that we've done. So I'm going to talk to you about T cells. And I'm just going to very briefly describe the sort of process whereby T cells become important in the immune response. I don't think I need to go into this in any detail now. but. Um, so naive T cells, there's a, a vast array of different specificities in our body. So, you know, there may be only 10 T cells in your, in your body that is specific for a particular antigen, let's say in this case a flu virus for the purpose of uh, discussion today. So these colours represent different specificities and all these T cells might have been hanging around for 20, 30 years. Um, uh, quiescent or more or less quiescent before you get a flu infection. So these are these uh, green viral particles that then get taken up by antigen presenting cells and presented on their surface. And then most of the T cells will ignore it, but the one green cell that is specific for it will um, notice it and, uh, and then expand and differentiate into effector cells which can lyse the targets immediately and, and clear the infection or the cancer in many cases. And then uh, you'll get a contraction phase, sorry I've screwed up my um, arrows here, but uh, from that you get this contraction phase where most of those cells will die and you'll be left with a, a small handful of cells that then become quiescent, hang around for many more decades, but are much more able to respond to the infection uh, when they're re-exposed. And so these are termed memory cells, and um, there's obviously that's the basis of vaccination, both in T cells and in B cells. Um, but where our focus here is, is in the T cells. So what do we know and not know about these cells? Because of the enormous interest in improving vaccination and the need to understand better what 
guides a cell towards becoming a memory cell. This is an extremely heavily studied area of research. Um, and there's vast amounts known about the sorts of molecules that seem to be involved that you can knock out and get more memory or less memory. Um, the markers that seem to be preferentially displayed on memory cells and uh, a lot about the dynamics and, and um, processes involved in response to antigen. Um, so, so we do know uh, that when you get this expansion, um, there's, there's, well, as I've said, you get an expansion and then a, a contraction and then there's just a handful of cells at the end, at, at least some of which are memory cells. Um, and we know that one clone can produce both effector and memory cells. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, really nice experiments this century that have uh, demonstrated that in lots of different ways. Uh, we know there's heterogeneity in the proportion of effector and memory cells and in the size of the response um, from these different clones. But there's still a huge amount not known. So there's still a lot of debate about this very fundamental uh, idea of do you get a naive cell that differentiates into an effector cell and then changes again into a memory cell? Or do you have memory cells sort of buried in here that can then become sort of effectors in ways that leave a few behind that stay as memory? Or is there, uh, there's all kinds of different hypotheses out there. And for many decades, they've been debated ad nauseum and, um, uh, we still don't really know. So we also don't know whether the variability that we see, the heterogeneity, is determined or random, and if determined, at what stage. So these were the sorts of things that I was particularly interested in tackling. And as I said, you know, this has mostly been explored in a sort of population-based analysis or when we've come more recently into single cell analysis as snapshots in time. And actually, as you heard in the last talk a little bit, that there's, there's markers that um, can be useful, but uh, they tend to change a lot, and um, they, they don't just change in terms of as the process goes along, so it's difficult to capture what really is a, a cell state, but they also change in terms of popularity in the literature and, and context. So depending on the infection that you're talking about or the mouse model that you're using, these markers are more or less useful. And so there's a lot of um, confusion that arises out of that. Um, and so there are ongoing uh, debates that, um, uh, this is illustrated here in, in a couple of Nature Review immunology papers in 2014 where one describes it as a deterministic but highly plastic process and the other talks about how it's, it's uh, really all about randomness with a little, little bit of um, stacking the odds. Um, and so the three models that sort of come out that are still under debate are this stochastic single responder model where you know, you have an inductive signal and then you've got this distribution of fate determinants which lead to some of the cells becoming one type and some becoming another. Or the, the most extreme deterministic model is where there's a, um, an asymmetry in the division, just as you heard about in the last talk, um, due to the polarizing signal from the antigen presenting cell, which means those, the two daughters of the first naive cell are molecularly distinct and, um, and then they've got different fate determinants in them that mean they, they're destined to become different, presumably one effector, one memory. Um, and there's a lot of experimental evidence to suggest that cells do undergo asymmetric cell division, some of which was produced in my lab. I'll turn the sound off now because we don't, actually, I don't know how. Um, I'll pull this plug out. Okay. Um, so... Uh, yeah, so, so it, it may well be that there is some asymmetric cell division, but there's, there's, there's a lot of doubt about whether that really plays a role here. And then there's this sort of dual responder model, which is that the cell really is fated to become one or the other at the beginning. Um, that certainly can't be absolute, but there's quite possibly um, a bit of that there. And so a lot of the literature has been people taking very, very, binary type uh, views on this, which of course is very good for getting high profile publications, but as has been illustrated many times this week, that's not really how biology tends 
to work. It's much messier. It's never black and white. And, and almost certainly there's a little bit of all three of these in the final solution once we get to it. Um, so um, I've been a bit dismissive of immunology, immunologist type uh, portrayal of this story. And um, I work a lot with cell biologists and developmental biologists who I think are perhaps more pragmatic and uh, moderate in their, their um, uh, views on life. Um, and, um, and I think there's a lot to be learned that immunologists could learn from, from a more developmental biology approach. And um, the asymmetric cell division that I talked about before was first discovered in the worm where um, the, after the egg is fertilized, it divides into two daughters which are uh, already observably distinct both in morphology and in molecules that are distributed in one and not the other. And that determines the fate of those two daughters and that's how you get this absolutely beautiful um, uh, very stereotypical differentiation patterns that has been um, described, and I'm sure all of you have seen many examples of this. Um, so, so really, you, you, you know everything that's going to happen from every cell within a C. elegans, and it's a highly deterministic process. And um, because of that, people have used a sort of longitudinal analysis of looking at each cell and what its daughters do and what its granddaughters do. And that's been incredibly powerful for um, understanding the basis of cell fate determination. Uh, and I thought I had another slide in there. What have I done with it? OK, never mind. Um, right, sorry. Um, so, so the understanding now in the field, as you would all be aware, is there's extrinsic inputs which will modulate cell fate um, at any stage. Um, and there are, of course, intrinsic in inputs, the genes of the cell uh, control its, its fate in a lot of ways, but there's many other things within the cell that will determine what happens. Now, they can, they can sort of work together to create some sort of programming in the cell, and that combines with stochastic events within the cell, and all of that together determines the, the cell state or the cell phenotype, and also the fate of its progeny. But it's a bit more complicated when you start thinking about um, the, the duration of the programming can be seconds to generations, so it might, it might just determine how the cell will change, and that will be a transient event, uh, impacting, for instance, on metabolomics or something like that. It might then imprint via epigenetic mechanisms um, and, and last longer. Um, and then there are, of course, congruence of events. So an extrinsic input might only be relevant if there's a stochastically controlled expression of a signaling component that means you can respond to that extrinsic input. So we need to understand the relative influence of all these inputs and how they're transmitted to the daughters before we can really understand how lineages are determined. And i just briefly mention Waddington's landscape, which is a nice way of thinking about cell fate decisions where you're basically the cell is at the top of a hill and there's multiple directions it can go and sometimes there's a deep valley and there's not many choices and sometimes it might be sort of at the top of a hill and have a sort of binary type choice and so there's lots of different uh, and ever-changing decisions for a cell to make within that that are influenced by all those different factors. Um, so as I've obviously led to here, we feel that we need to understand uh, this process by watching the whole thing as it unfolds. And yes, this is the slide that I was looking for. So this is what was so beautifully done in C. elegans. And John Sulston, who died last year, won the Nobel Prize for these just sitting in front of the microscope, watching from one cell to two cell, drawing pictures to get in his head how um, how each cell differentiated, when it divided, all those sorts of things, and then created the pedigrees that have just been so so incredibly powerful since then. Um, so that's great. We should do it too. There's two big problems for that. So the first, which is what most of my talk will be about, is that T cell pedigrees are not invariant. Nearly everything in a mammalian cell is not invariant like this. So there's, there's not that nice clean, you just look at it in one or two animals, you've got the pattern, and then you can start thinking about how it works. Um, 
And the other issue is that T cells are very fast moving, that's what they're designed to do. So they're really not amenable to the kind of nice, gentle, look down the microscope and draw pictures um, uh, type of experiment that Salston did. Um, and so I'll briefly tell you how we overcome those problems to actually generate pedigrees and then I'll spend most of the talk talking about how we tackle the, the variation within the pedigrees. So about 10 years ago, we um, developed these uh, fairly simple, um, um, we call them cell paddocks, so they're just arrays of walls about 60 microns high and if you drop the T cells into these in a solution on a microscope slide, then they'll just sort of settle at the bottom of the paddock. 50 microns and the T cells will climb over, but you get, get it right and they'll stay nicely in, in there. And they're still able to exchange uh, media and so on, so they stay happy in those. And so we drop the antigen presenting cells into these paddocks first, that's depicted by these red blobs here. Um, and we give them an antigen to present, in this case, a uh, ovalbumin peptide, for which uh, we have a very nice, well-characterized transgenic mouse system where all the T cell receptors are able to recognize this peptide. Um, and they're also transgenic for green fluorescent proteins, so they're all green, so we can watch them. And then we uh, wash off all the rubbish, and there's thousands of paddocks in there, so we just look for the ones that have only one dendritic cell and one T cell and we ignore all the rest and we program the microscope to just keep track of those and we do time-lapse imaging. So this is one example of that. So here's a red dendritic cell that settled itself in the corner of the paddock and uh, this is a green T cell that's sitting on it. And this is 24 hours after we started the experiment. Um, usually a T cell takes about a day and a half to get activated and undergo its first division. Um, so, so you're just seeing it here when it's sort of sitting there. You can't tell from looking at it, but it's responding to the antigen. And then at 32 hours in this case, um, you can just see there's two green blobs there now, so it's just divided. And at this point, in most of our experiments, we take the two daughter cells out, put them in new paddocks, and we do that regularly to make sure that we've got accurate tracking. Um, so now on this side, you'll see those two daughters, we image over, this is probably about a week, and they divide, and they divide again, and they divide again, and of course, it, you know, it's ridiculous that this, there's no way you can know what's going on, but in those first few generations, it's actually, you know, they are readily trackable. Um, so at about eight to 16 cell stage, Mohammed Yassin, who did this work, um, would uh, have his phone linked to the microscope, so he'd wake up at three in the morning and realize the cells had just undergone another division and he'd go back in and micro pipette them into new paddocks and go home to bed and wait three more days and eventually he would get really nice, well trackable um, cell clones out of this. So then we needed to be able to get accurate enough tracks to rely on the pedigrees and most of the software at this time was uh, didn't allow for corrections and so you have one missed cue and you'd lose the whole pedigree so um, um, Raz Shimoni developed a MATLAB based toolbox for um, doing the cell segmentation and tracking in such a way that we could quantify lots of different characteristics during the uh, cell cell divisions and do it in high throughput but with quality control by which I really mean manual correction capacity and I had kind of a sweatshop of teenagers in my house uh, plugging away doing thousands maybe tens of thousands of hours of um, uh, uh, manually correcting these things. Uh, I've turned quite a few student teenagers off biology I think by doing this. They earned a bit of money but uh, they th thought it was pretty boring, but anyway, um, so we got the, the all nicely corrected and then uh, used the tactics to kind of play around with the data a bit and assemble the pedigrees. So um, the pedigrees took a long time to get perfect, but in the meantime, we could do some simpler things with the data. Um, and particularly, we could just enumerate the clone, clonal expansion over time. And uh, so this is just a schematic of a few of the things that we could get out of this that meant we could start to learn what 
what early events impacted on what later events. So, of course, we could see when the naive cell docked on the dendritic cell and when that cell started to grow, which indicated that it had responded to the antigen presentation and when the first division was. And so we'd sort of collect up these parameters as described above. And then we'd see the cells dividing and we'd see um, a peak at the time at which they, they reached their peak and what the number was at that peak and so on. So just a few things that we could look at, which I'll go through now. So here, here are 16 clones. That, so this was basically one big experiment that, that was started about nine years ago and we still haven't published on it. It's taken us a long time to get to this point, um, but we're nearly there now. So um, you can see just looking at these 16 different clones, which actually come from two experiments, B and C, um, that um, there's a wide range in the, in the amplification capacity. Uh, there's also a range in um, when they start to die and contract. Um, and uh, so all of that stuff looks pretty interesting. Um, as a first pass, we just looked at whether the heterogeneity that we saw seemed comparable with what's been seen in vivo, where there's some beautiful barcoding studies that have looked at the contribution of different clones to the total clonal response. So we kind of did a thought experiment of putting all the clones together and seeing what, you know, what percent proportions they all contributed to. And you can see, from, whoops, sorry. You can see from this that, um, um, there, there is a wide variation in contribution and this changes over time. So it's not like one clone starts to win and keeps winning. There seems to be some jostling in there. Um, so that, that was good mostly for verifying that we, we, um, we have a system that seems to represent what's seen in vivo. And it's important to mention that so here we've actually constrained a lot of the sources of variability that that occur in vivo. So there's not uh, there's not all kinds of different competition for resources. We've given them all the IL two that they need. They only had they had plenty of time to stay on the antigen presenting cell. They weren't com out competed by other T cells. Um, that, you know, all that sort of thing was actually eliminated. So even once we've got rid of all of that and given them, you know, the highest level peptide so that the signal was saturated, we still see this variation in clonal response. Um, but then we started to hone in more on, okay, well, what might, might be the underlying cause of this change in clonal response? So because we were tracking all these cells, we can actually monitor their time of birth and death. And so from our 16 pedigrees, which some of them went out to nine generations, we had 884 cells that we tracked until the next division. Um, and then we had another uh, 81 that we tracked until death. Um, and 381 that we couldn't track till the end of their life, but that they seemed to last for a very long time. In fact, 18.5 hours, whereas the average cell division time is about eight hours. So these were strikingly long-lived cells, uh, even though they're, they're definitely very interesting from a biological perspective, but not really useful for any kind of mathematics on the system because they're censored. We haven't, we don't know whether they died in the end or how much longer they lived for. So um, they're, they're depicted in pink here. And so you can see from looking at this, so there's a generation one, two, three, four, five. Uh, the, first, the, the first generation, of course, is much longer because the cells had to be activated. The next three look remarkably similar to each other and there's really very tight um, homogeneity in, in the, the lifespan of these cells. And then suddenly everything starts to go crazy in generation five. Um, so we've got these, as I said, these pink long-lived ones. That's where death starts to come in, the blue ones. And then even the ones that we have tracked till the next cell division, they're kind of much more spread out. Um, so this is, is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, we were not expecting this kind of tightness in the first few generations. Most of uh, what immunologists do to compare T cell responses is to just take, take, count the number of cells or look at the number of divisions at about day three and say, well, this condition yielded more divisions than that one, so um, there must be a better clonal response. But in fact, you know, there doesn't seem to be much there to predict anything because there's just no changes. Um, so that was surprising. And then also the fact that these cells would uh, stretch out their cell cycle, but continue to divide was 
very surprising too because the dogma in the field is really that you proliferate rapidly and then you drop out of cell cycle into quiescence and uh, there's not really this in-between stage considered in most of the models. So that was interesting. Um, and then also interesting that all this action occurs at generation five. So something's going on there. Let's see if we can probe that a bit more deeply and learn more from it. Um, oh, sorry. I can't do it with that. So, oh, and this is just another way of depicting those, the cells that we did track to next life. We're just sort of looking at it in terms of proportion not yet divided. And, and what this really highlights is just how incredibly uniform the distributions of this, the uh, lifespan is in those generations two, three, and four. And then at gen five, you start to see, you know, some of the cells following the curve, but then others elongating out. And then there's just nothing that looks like two, three, and four after that. So um, that's just... Just sort of, yes, yep. So you show there's this in here, yes, yep. Sorry, did I look at what? <laughs> yes, so. Uh, yeah, so we've done a, we've done a lot of that mother-daughter correlation, sibling correlations, which I actually didn't put into this. Um, maybe come back to that question because uh, yeah, there's there's possibly things you would be interested in that we haven't shown from the rest. But uh, yeah, there's there's other things that might be helpful to you. So um, okay, so Gen five, what's going on there? Why do the cells suddenly sort of start to look different? So we thought, well, we'll just hone in on it a bit more in terms of just the rates of change there. And of course, it's clearly not going to be exponential. So what else does it fit? And does that help us anywhere? And just very simplistically, it fits a sigmoid curve. And so you can derive from that an inflection point, which presumably can allow for each clone, you've got a single number that, that reflects when this change happened. Um, and in fact, if you go back and just take, just smooth the data, you can also derive that first inflection point. It seems to correlate very nicely with the sigmoid fit. So you don't need to do that sigmoid fit. You just do see this sort of sudden change in the growth rates. And um, to go with that, we wanted other numbers that reflected the behavior of the clones. And so we... Um, looked at, uh, just to remind you, this is, you know, what the profiles look like. So there's always a, a peak height and there's always a peak time. And then um, if you think about what is probably needed for an immune response to a virus, you want a rapid response, you want a strong response, and you probably want an enduring response, uh, although not too enduring because it makes you sick having that response. So, so that height, timing, and the area under the curve seem to us some numbers that might well reflect quite well the, the overall um, contribution of this clone to immunity. Um, and we just sort of correlated each with the other to see they, they seem to all reflect something slightly different because they don't correlate perfectly, but they're obviously interrelated in some way. So we should just sort of look at all three while we're scouring around looking for interesting things in this process. Um, so, um, as I said, we're now thinking of that inflection point, whether we derive it, in this case, we've derived it from the smooth data. We wanted to look at whether that actually predicts the overall response. So we looked at correlations with those three uh, clonal response numbers that I just told you about, and they look reasonably good. So it looks as if that's whatever's going on at the beginning is actually important for the entire thing. Because don't forget, there's the time at which the cells start to die, you could imagine being an extremely important part of the overall clonal response. But um, here it seems that this time at which the cells um, start to elong elongate their cell cycle actually matters as well. And we've got no idea at this point about it's so messy at the top where you've got continuing proliferation and death. We just don't, don't want to look at that yet in terms of trying to understand things. But that Gen 5 um, change in behaviour does seem to be at least somewhat important for the overall clonal response. So that seemed interesting to us. Um, but then more interesting is, well, how does that occur? So if you think about it, there's 16 cells at Generation 5. Um, 
to actually impact on the overall clonal response. They've probably all got to behave similarly, so that maybe suggests there's something, you know, that, that they are all showing a, a change there, at, at, or, or some of them sh showing a synchronized change there, which perhaps suggests that there's some deterministic behavior in that. Maybe that means there's latent programming because, you know, you didn't see any evidence of it in the generations before that. So that's sort of where our minds were heading, trying to wonder how we would actually tackle that. And, um, you know, we just kind of, we got pretty good at doing correlations now, so we correlated everything with everything, mostly with the idea that um, let's see whether there are anything right at the beginning of the beh behaviour of the cells that can predict anything later on. So I'm not going to run you through that. That would be quite agonizing, but I'll just highlight the the most striking finding. So we we wanted to, we, we used this area under the cur curve as the reflection of the total clonal response, and we looked at the time from the T cell docking on the antigen presenting cell to the time it divided, which seemed like the kind of activity that should influence the the overall clonal response, and it really doesn't look like it. But what was more striking was that the size of the founder cell just before division did show a pretty nice uh, correlation with the overall clonal response. So that suggests there is imprinting right from the beginning um, to some extent. Um, and even more surprising was that the size of the founder cell before it had hit the dendritic cell, the antigen presenting cell, showed a nice correlation with the overall clonal response. So that's not so interesting from the math side of it, but it's pretty interesting from the biology side of it. If you can take a cell and just look at its size and say, yep, you're going to be a good responder, then that potentially has implications for cancer immunotherapies where you're sorting T cells to put back into the patient and so on. So, um, so we will explore that further. We've got done nothing more to functionally verify that at this point. Um, so um, now we've got this idea that there's imprinting somewhere. We want to know sort of at what generation, how it might, might uh, evolve. And so we're really now starting to think about how do fates diverge within the clones rather than between the clones. And of course, that's where the pedigrees come into play. So I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of the pedigrees to give you a feel for how we look at them. So this is a particularly complex one because it's just to illustrate that we, we, we so here we start with the founder cell, that the, the length of the horizontal line indicates the time till the next division. So you see these first two daughters and then they yield more daughters and so on. So that's pretty straightforward, but we've overlaid onto it, in this case, the cell size over time. So we've measured these cells every 30 seconds. We needed to do that for the accuracy of the tracking, but it then yields a lot more information that could come in quite handy. We've not really explored that in any great detail at this point, but um, this is just to show. So what you see here is the, the trajectories of these lines uh, overlaid onto each cell is the change in cell size during the cell's lifespan, and the color is coded according to the mean uh, of that size compared to all the rest in the pedigree. Um, so ignoring this red line here, which is different because these cells started small, um, then uh, you can sort of see here some subtle changes in the average size as well as some interesting changes in the size with, within the lifespan of the cell. But more than that, for the purposes of this talk, you can see here that you know we can get interesting changes in the lifespan that are all depicted and it's a bit messy and there's stuff going on all over the place. Some of the pedigrees are extremely uniform and this is one example of that. There's really nothing to look at in terms of difference between the two arms of the pedigree or at any stage throughout it. Um, and others are not uniform. And so, you know, this, in this one they looked pretty similar here, which makes sense now that we know about this generation two to four um, similar behavior, but then suddenly one side starts to suddenly drop out of cycle and most of the cells live and the other side, lots of cells die, um, but they proliferate quite a lot before it. So we sat on this data for a long time. I, with my biologist non-numerical rose-colored glasses, I feel like this is proving that there is asymmetry within the cells, but you know, it depends what 
order of the pedigrees you look at, whether that's compelling or not, and we really needed systematic ways to look at that. So uh, the simplest thing to start with was just to say, well, let's take the two daughters, the generation two cells, and, and, and compare them to each other. So this is the same sort of um, clonal response profiles that I showed you for the naive cells. Now we're just taking for, for each clone, comparing one daughter to the other. And again here, you know, you can see some that look beautifully similar to each other, um, and others look that look quite quite different, that one, for instance, and that one. Um, so there's a range, there's a range of behavior even at this level within the clones. And of course, because we've got these numbers that we can now generate, we can quantify that. So these are just sibling correlations of the area under the curve and the time to, um, um, to extend the lifespan and the peak height and so on. And you can see that uh, there's you know, there's some correlation between the siblings for all of them. It seems to be most striking for this uh, time of inflection. Um, so uh, it's suggesting that there's, there's a, a, a fair variation that is due to the founder cell. And we sort of say half of the variation when you look at the peak height and a quarter of the variation when you look at the area under the curve is explained by the choice of the naive cell. So there's some, something there that seems to be determined. Um, and then when you go back and think about the size, that all sort of fits together quite nicely. Um, but we really are more interested in, you know, what's going on beyond that. Is there uh, some kind of stochastic event that changes things at generation five or, you know, what, what really is, is happening here? So... Um, that, that's basically that slide. You know, we just need to know how to quantify the fate divergence more closely. Now, this is the, the most maths in my project, and I'm not going to tell you about it because I don't understand it well enough to tell you about it. So I'm just going to give you the punchline. But basically what we said was we wanted to systematically go through the entire tree looking at the source of variation for every change at every generation. So... That seemed like, you know, it's an extension of the sorts of correlations that I've shown you. There must be some statistical framework where you can take a tree and process it along that, that way. And so um, I talked to my friends who know this kind of stuff, Terry Speed and Damien Hicks, and they said, yeah, of course, there'll be something like that. And so they went off looking and there didn't seem to be anything. So they basically had to come up with it from, from scratch, and that's a paper that was published this year in PROS Computational Biology where they, um, yeah, as I say, I'm not going to tell you about it. You can look at the paper if you want to understand it because I won't be able to give you any useful information. But by the process that they go through, they then can actually achieve this, this method of whatever we want to look at, whether it's cell size at generation six or um, a, a differentiation marker at generation three, um, we can now actually look at uh, how much of the variation there is explained at each generation and how much of the phenotype is transmitted and expressed at each generation. So um, we tested this, well, we tested it on a simulated branching process and then that just sort of shows that uh, you get the expected values. We would also tested it on some publicly available data from the worm uh, where we looked at the... Um, differentiation of pharyngeal cells, um, which have a marker that's expressed at generation seven. And you can see here, so this is the expression of the marker. So for the first few generations, you see nothing, and then suddenly it shoots up at generation seven. But the source of variation of this marker comes into play at generation three, predominantly, and five. So that's a kind of messy thing, but if you go back through the literature and really delve into some of the old papers that were done when these first pedigrees were first coming up, um, there, there was, in a, just by sort of observing and, you know, wondering about what might happen and playing around, um, uh, it was proven that there is a decision that there's a now a molecular basis for that comes into play here that's important. And then there's another decision for which there is a molecular basis identified at generation five. So there's this sort of weird thing that goes on in the middle where cells drop out of the, the uh, differentiation um, process. But um, this is all 
nicely validates what has been done in a sort of ad hoc matter before. And that shows that you can now systematically go through these pedigrees and, and look for sources of variation. So we're pretty excited by, by that. We've not yet really been able to apply it to our T cell pre pedigrees. That's probably going to come in the next few weeks, hopefully. But this is just one example that that we published in this paper where we're look, just looking at cell size at generation four and looking at the source of variation. And for in this instance, the source of variation was all in the founder cell. There was basically no influence from it, almost all 80%. Um, so that, we hope, will be able to really give us a lot more insight into, into where fate is determined. Um, and so I'm nearly finished. I've just got three slides to... Um, talk about how that we've basically just talked about proliferation here which is effector cell expansion that's important but i mentioned memory at the beginning we're very interested in that and as i showed you in the in the um uh, clonal profiles there are some cells hanging around at the end of our experiment which we would like to think are memory precursors and so of course it would be great if within this framework we would be able to identify these memory cells and, and where they were where they were determined. Um, so memory cells, um, as you, you already know, become evident after the effector cell population contracts. And at that stage, they're marked by a small cell size and are quiescent. Um, although, as I say, the definition of quiescence maybe should change a bit now that we've got these long-lived cycling cells. Um, and they also, as I mentioned, there's a lot of debate about all the different markers. But High CD62L is one marker that seems reasonably robust in the sorts of experimental systems that we're using here, the OT1 mouse. Um, so we put into our system, I have mentioned it before, but we put in dilute antibody, fluorescent antibody to CD62L so that the cells would brighten up and be red if they started to express this marker. And um, we've measured this crudely so far in the cells. And this is just a little snippet of preliminary data. So we're looking at one clone here, and we've taken the average size for each cell within the clone, yeah, each cell within the clone, and we've um, color coded according to generation, and we've, um, that, sorry, sorry, the average, the average size is reflected by the, the symbol size. So this is a smaller cell and this is a bigger cell. Um, and the CD62L expression is, um, is, is on the y-axis and time is on this axis. So of course, this is basically the time that the cells divided and you can see that, you know, we had one cell, no, that's a spot, we didn't show the one cell, I can't, I can't remember. Anyway, um, there's the two daughter cells, the four granddaughter cells, the eight great granddaughter cells all squashed together and then you start to see things uh, getting a bit more interesting. So out to here, you've got uh, one batch of cells that have divided more rapidly than the other. And so the other thing we did here was outline the, the progeny of one side of the um, clone, uh, so progeny of one daughter um, in, in a dark line and leave the other one unoutlined. So you can see that they're starting to segregate here uh, with, with this outlier. And then that sort of changes with time here. So now the big cells are low for CD62L and dividing more rapidly, and the smaller cells that come from the other half of the pedigree are high for CD62L and dividing more slowly. So that's a hint to us that we're, what we're seeing here is a memory cell differentiation that's emerging slowly over time, and this is just in one clone. So we haven't done this for all the clones, and as you saw before, most of them aren't so asymmetric that you would be able to see this uh, this um, exposure of the difference between the two cells. But we, um, we think now if there's ways that we can actually sort of combine these different features into one statistical analysis, we can start to, to um, get a feel for what proportion of the cells exhibit, of the clones exhibit memory differentiation and uh, how that's also segregated within the clones. So the conclusions are really that cell proliferation is homogeneous in the first few generations, and that's quite surprising. Um, it's partly imposed by a change in the, the overall clonal response is partly imposed by a change in the fate of the cell, both proliferation and death, at generation five. Um, but this 
decision is transmitted right back from the naive founder cell and just sort of hidden until generation five. Um, and the clonal response can be predicted by the size of the cell before antigen presentation. So there are reasonably strong conclusions from this and our very tentative ones are that there may be an opportunity here to see memory bifurcation at generation two in some clones, certainly not in all of them. And so the vague idea we've got now is that uh, asymmetric cell division probably occurs in a few cells, not all, and that's what everybody's seen, including us, that it's not, it's not ubiquitous to, to all T cells. Um, but perhaps the ones that do were the ones that then show this bifurcation in fate later on. Uh, and um, it looks like the memory cells are arising from the effector cells. I haven't shown you, but we've actually done functional analysis on those Gen 5 cells and they all exhibit effector properties. So if these are memory cells, then we've definitely got a naive to effector to memory uh, process going on here. So this, of course, is in a very constrained uh, artificial setup, but we're, what we're hoping is that the findings that we've got here that are, you know, reasonably absolute can then be brought back into the broader models of in vivo uh, T cell immunology to actually sort of start to test whether this might also fit with those models and how that might change the interpretation. So I'll stop there and just, uh, I think I've mentioned Muhammad was key to this, uh, Damien, um, and Raz did the early early data. Kajal did a lot of the uh, correlations, and um, Federico helped us with with that work. And uh, Terry Speed also helped provide statistical advice along the way. Thank you very much.